Hello and a very warm welcome. Welcome to Weekly Current Affairs. My name is Madhusudan Reddy and we will be covering, covering up the current affairs that are covered in the last one week. We will be taking up articles from various newspapers and we will be taking up these articles which are re very relevant to your examination. So let's start with this today's session. Today our first article is regarding the Mohsin Ram and Chirapunji where the av annual average rainfall in the Mohsin Ram and Chirapunji it is said that the rainfall is somewhere around 1400 centimeters. But in spite of this amount of rainfall, there are some news articles which are talking about droughts in this region. Now, why do we have droughts in spite of that big rainfall? This is the question. For that, we have to look into different types of droughts and we, have also, we should also look into what are these different types of droughts, how are they defined, right? Firstly, before we get into all of these details, first let us quickly look into the article what it says. The article says that on an average, Mohsin Ram receives 1400 centimeters of rainfall but the area in spite of this good amount of rainfall there are droughts now what is this kind of drought here the drought which you get to see is of drought which is associated with soil moisture theek okay. Droughts halag alag type ki hota hai, kuch meteorological droughts hai, hydrological droughts will be there, agricultural droughts, ecological droughts and socio-economic droughts as well. See firstly we have a general conception that if the amount of rainfall is less, then we consider it as a drought. But for government, the definitions are different. The definition is in such a way that meteorological drought is a drought where the annual, anfall, annual rainfall, if it is less, then it is considered to be a meteorological drought. Now, when it comes to the hydrological drought, see, there are lakes, there are rivers and there are aquifers. So, in these lakes and rivers and aquifers, if the water capacity has come down, then also it is considered to be a drought and that kind of drought is hydrological drought. And thirdly, agricultural drought. See, agricultural drought is associated with the component of shortage of water which damages and destroys agricultural crops. Now, this can be of any reason. Okay, it can be of any reason. Now, coming to the ecological rot. See, ecological rot is associated with soil moisture. Now, you might be wondering, what is this soil moisture? How is this associated with rot? For example, there is a hard rock. Okay? There is a hard rock. This rock is hard. No matter how much amount of the rainfall it receives, the water will simply flood and flush off. And the this particular soil cannot take any amount of water. Now, in this condition also, there are, in this place, the vegetation is not much productive. So, even this condition is also called as drought. Now, if you look into the Mohsin Ram and Chirapunji, these Mohsin Ram and Chirapunji, they are located in the northeastern region, especially if you see the map of India, they will be located in the, this is Garo Hills, Kasi Hills and Jayantia Hills. So, in between this Mohsin Ram and Chirapunji is there. Now, if you see this plateau, this plateau is extension of the entire peninsular India. In between, you will have Bangladesh, right? This is your Bangladesh. See, physiologically, this Bangladesh is considered to be a gap, a gap between your peninsular India and the Meghalaya plateau. In the Meghalaya plateau, you will find Mohsin Ram and Chirapunji and here you will receive on an average of 1200 to 1400 centimeters of rainfall. But now here you have to understand that this particular area has hard rocks. The rocks are hard, the surface is hard because of which even if there is any large amounts of rainfall, the soil cannot take any moisture. In such a condition, we consider it as a drought prone area as well. So, from this date, we have to have this conception that droughts are not just in terms of rainfall, your droughts can be of different types as well, right? Now, this is the article that talks about and in this, from the preliminary examination point of view, from MCK examination point of view, you have to understand two more things. You have to understand the lifestyle and the living conditions of these people who are living in this heavy, heavy rainfall area. Right. In general, the localites believe that umbrellas cannot do justice to that kind of rainfall. So, in that scale, what they do is, they have developed a local traditional umbrella that is called kunup. Okay. Kunups. 
so local people who are working there when they go out every day they have to wear this kunup so this is part of their traditional culture so that's why kunups become their integral part of the culture right now what is kunup the image which you see here the man who is working always works with a kunup kunup is nothing but a traditional umbrella which is made up of bamboo right so this is kunup and secondly the lifestyle that is associated with the northeastern people especially in the mosinram and chirapunji they have living root bridges now what is this living root bridges and this living root bridges also has a recognition that living with the heritage they are also called as the concept of effective utilization of available resources now these people they have the tendency to live with the nature while living with the nature they do not construct roads if they wanted to go from one hill to another hill right in meghalaya so what they do is if there are local traditional trees of banyan trees these trees they use it and they tend to bridge the build they tend to build the bridge now this bridges are built using the roots of the tree now it doesn't mean that all the bridges are built in this way only few bridges where the possibility is there now this has a recognition of world heritage in terms of living with the local resources and effective utilization of resources as well right these are called living root bridges now this is our first article when we go to the second article this is an article which has been published in the indian express and the new indian express newspaper which talks about the asiatic lions should now go out of the gir see in india lions are only present in the area of gir national park that too in gujarat so in the recent times if you go back into the 5 to 6 years since the inception of the cheetah project it is said that before cheetahs are being brought into india it was time for lions to be relocated from gir national park which is located in gujarat so the supreme court has once given clearance that gir gir national park mein jo lions hai they have to be relocated from this place to national park in kunopalpu wildlife sanctuary now where is kunopalpu wildlife sanctuary why this is located in the just a minute this is located in the madhya pradesh right in the state of madhya pradesh so gir national park is here i hope you are able to see this now gir national park which is located in gujarat it is considered to be the pride pride of gujarat and gujarat state they do not want to give their pride to any other state or they doesn't want to stay, stay share, share this so in the recent times when the government has asked the supreme court has asked to shift this lions to the other place it is then came the picture of cheetahs so cheetahs were also chosen for the same location that is kunopalpu wildlife sanctuary so by august 15th it is said that we are going to get cheetahs in this kunopalpu wildlife sanctuary and we have discussed in detail but why do these animals need to be shifted from one location to another location this is the question see you can also answer these kind of questions in your comment section if you are aware of here the question is why animals from the gir national parks need to be shifted to a different region why can't be they be kept like that see the answer is if you go back into the current affairs of last one year the gir national park has faced with a disease called canine distemper now what is this canine distemper animals who are living in that region when they have attacked dogs dogs had a specific disease that is called canine distemper that disease has been transferred to the lions so because of that in that year around 24 lions have dead are dead so it is understood that this disease has taken the life of the lions because these lions which are present in that region are very genetically screwed it means to say that the genetic diversity among these animals is very less so there is a concept of interbreeding intrabreeding now these animals which are living in that area they do not have the genetic makeup of another region because of which it is said that they are genetically not very strong any small disease which can come and attack so now it's time for us to when we le- relocate the species to a different location then over a period of time the animals that are living in that location will start to adapt to that localized conditions slowly slowly the genetic makeup changes and if we tend to interbreed or interbreed these species again after few years the genetic diversity will start to increase now when genetic diversity increases it is said that the chances of survival with respect to this animals will also increase 
right similarly this is also case with the tigers and this is also case with the leopards as well as the leopards population is very much rampant we need no, we are not much concerned about them but keystone species and umbrella species like your lion tiger which are very much important they need to be conserved so the supreme court has given a clearance that lions should also be relocate, relocated now they are looking out for the locations and a panel has been set up the panel is ministry forms panel to look out for sites right they are looking out for sites now which is the best location to look into or translocate this animals to a different location right so earlier the idea was to relocate this gir national park wildlife sanctuary and gir wildlife sanctuary lions to kuno but now the idea has been more or less silent why because it is the same place where cheetahs are also coming see lion can easily eat away cheetah right cheetahs are they are fast animals but they cannot be always surviving from these big animals so if at all we bring cheetahs from namibia africa and still if these animals are relocated into the same area it becomes a difficult task to survive now the cheetah reintroduction program is going under a fenced to program okay for example if this is your kuno wildlife sanctuary they are going to fence this kuno wildlife sanctuary and they are going to monitor these cheetahs so at this point of time it is understood that relocation of this lions to this particular national park is not a viable solution now a ministry has now been looking into the locations at various places right now next article this is in the hindu newspaper published article which talks about census delay to hit policies experts see the last census which we got the socio economic census which we got was in the year 2011 so uh, it's it is already 2022 and it is generally expected that every 10 years the census should be out as the census is not yet out it is said that the programs the government policies which are to be framed they are all based on the census so if at all this census is not yet out the government implementation of the programs and the policy making that will also be delayed now here comes the role of a finance commission also because the disbursement and the devolution of funds with respect to the central government and state government is taken is addressed by the finance commission so let us quickly look into what exactly does the finance commission do and what is the role of finance commission with respect to the census once the census is given based on that population data will also come out this population data will be used by the finance commission to devolve the taxes you go and buy any product in the market that product will have two taxes one can be a direct tax one can be an indirect tax and that indirect tax is collected by state government or the central government and it is given to the central government as well so there are more funds with the central government so whatever the taxes that is collected in the name of sgst and cgst the same amount is also collected by the central government and it will start to give out to the states in the form of devolution of taxes now what is this devolution of taxes of the total 100% amount that is collected by the central government the money will be disbursed to the state government with respect to the ratio of 42 to 58 right 42 out of every 100 rupees 42 rupees will be disbursed to the state and 58 rupees will be kept by the center now this 42 rupees should be given to each state now is it the same amount that is given to the uttar pradesh and also the amount that is given to the tripura the same see the population in uttar pradesh is very large and the population in tripura is very less so if you give large amounts to the tripura now it feels an unfair activity to the uttar pradesh as well so that's why the finance commission has come up with the devolution process and in that they have given certain criteria back in 2014 that is the 14th finance commission the share of the population is only is about 27.5% but later this 27.5% has been shifted or changed to 15% of the weightage of the total population that is given with respect to the funding from the devolution of taxes right now this 15% of the total population was taken with respect to the 2011 census right 2011 mein jo census hai unko basis they have taken the basis for this of the 15% of the weightage of this 42% will be given to the states right that means 15% of the total population of up sorry the po- total population of the up is very high right that means the weightage to the up should go more that means more money will be given to the up on the basis of population composition now here comes the conflict that states which are present in the southern part of india theek hai 
देयर पॉपुलेशन कंट्रोल हैज बीन टेकन प्लेस ठीक है यहां पे जितने भी स्टेट्स है ना देयर पॉपुलेशन हैज बीन कंट्रोल्ड डोंट यू थिंक दैट इट इज अनफेयर और इनजस्टिस टू दीज स्टेट्स व्हेन दे हैव कंट्रोल द पॉपुलेशन एंड द वेटेज विद रिस्पेक्ट टू मनी इज आल्सो टेकन इनटू कंसीडरेशन सो दैट्स व्हाई that's why the government of india with respect to the finance commission has also given some kind of incentives if you control the population you will be given additional money if you increase the forest you will be given little more money right so all of this are associated with the population here comes into the picture that we have to learn and look into the finance commission right especially the devolution of taxes and for the examination point of view we have to remember this table right in the forest and ecology it has 10% of weightage area the geographical area has 15 percentage of weightage and with respect to the income distance that has around 45 percentage of weightage and when it comes to population 15 percent of the weightage is taken into consideration that means pop states with larger population they will get little more extra money states with less population they will get less money right for this for this data census is very much important because it's been more than a decade that we had our census and we are looking into various other aspects of the census as well as in when the census is out we'll be taking up in detail and detailed discussion as well now next article this is an article which is published in the hindu newspaper it talks about the there is a rare flight of bird from antarctica it came all the way to tamil nadu so what is the issue here what is this article talking about see firstly you have to understand that birds can migrate across hemispheres birds can move from mongolia to south africa they can even move from Ar arctic circle to antarctic circle as well now why does these birds move or migrate from one place to another place here you have to understand that migration is a survival survival task if these birds do not migrate from this place to another place they will die in that year why it is because of the climate their physiological conditions and their body is designed in such a way they could not sustain more amount of temperatures or lack of water or lack of grasslands right they also need some food so for that only in certain seasons they will be able to live in those conditions now they will start to move from this place to another place where they find a suitable location now you will be amazed to know that there are birds that can easily travel all the way across from mongolia to south africa they just stop for 2 or 3 days 2 days in nagaland to eat and get their food and then they take a flight and come back all the way to south africa now this kind of bird this bird's name is amur falcon right but here we have to discuss about another bird that is albatross see albatross is one such bird which is generally found in the antarctica region but for reasons not known this bird is now moving to tamil nadu right it came to the tamil nadu especially the palg bay right in the gulf of manar if this is your tamil nadu here is your silanka and this is the area we are talking about right this bird has come all the way from antarctica now why did this bird come to this region why is it important for our examination to look into these kind of articles see migration is a survival task now the, we should look this angle this article from climate change right climate change and also we should know that how birds travel how does birds travel you see i have given you an example that one of the bird will travel all the way from mongolia to south africa how do these birds know that route please comment in the comment section if you are aware of it how does these birds know the exact route every year they come to nagaland from nagaland all the way they go to south africa america now i'm talking about different bird this is amur falcon okay how does this bird know they have to travel in the same direction they uses the technology of magnetic field birds use the technology of magnetic field of the earth and they can align themselves and they also take the help of the winds winds that are trade winds okay trade winds ko lekar they'll start to travel from one region to another region if at all imagine in the month of june and july see in the month of june and july we have monsoon season in india that means our trade winds are in this direction right that is how we get our monsoons 
if a bird that is going against these winds don't you think that that bird has to need so much of energy it has to fly against this wind right it needs more energy so that's why the birds are also very smart during the time of monsoon time period they fly in the same direction of the winds now when winds start to move in opposite direction they will start to fly along with that right so this is one such methodology the birds will usually fly like that there are many number of birds and there are many highways for the birds now these highways are called asian flyways fly ways birds highways birds ka jo highways hai na they are called flyways now if you look into these flyways there are many number of flyways across the world a bird can move from south af south america to all the way to the alaska as well right a bird can move from south america to even till russia as well every year they take a round and they come back right such a small bird it is traveling all the way right if they take once if once they take flight they won't stop they directly go to their destination right so here the current bird which we are seeing is coming from antarctica to india but there is no such fly route in spite of that how did we find this bird here now the scientific community estimates that the bird is here because of the change in the pressure belt right change in the pressure belt today the winds that are coming to india if you see they are monsoonal winds okay we are getting monsoonal winds this bird might have used that pressure change in the pressure and it has traveled all the way to this region right now why why should we worry about this bird see generally birds from non identified areas if they are coming into your location there are two different kinds of threats number one that bird could have been a diseased bird if you look into the flu bird flu avian flu all the diseases that are associated with the birds they can transmit from one bird to another bird and that bird can transfer to our daily eating habits where we you where generally the consumption of non vegetarian is taken now that can spill over so it is very important for us to watch over these kind of abnormalities on one side we have to be very much happy or we we should also be unhappy for that happy because it has it is now being a breeding ground for these kind of birds ecologically it is a positive thing on another side we have to look for the climate change angles a cold living bird that lives in antarctica at a lower temperatures how is it able to survive in this temperatures this is what we have to look forward for and secondly we should also look for the examination from the examination point of view the flyways that are passing through india okay the flyways that are passing through india see what are these flyways we have the bird flyway one flyway is asian flyway that means every year the birds will travel through india one of the example is amur falcon that i have told you you have to understand the significance and importance of this amur falcon as well firstly you see the amur falcon which starts from mongolia lands in nagaland when it lands in nagaland what it does it will eat away all the flies that are present in that region now that is a very good positive sign why because those bugs small small bugs which are present in that area it, during the time of harvest they come and eat that harvest now this bird will come and eat those small birds because of which the people who are living in that area they'll having better breed better yield with respect to the food right so let us quickly look into what was the light mattered albatross spotted it was spotted in the a beach that is antoniari puram beach right antoniari puram beach it is the this is where the area the bird has been spotted and why was it spotted here it is said that this bird has come all the way from 5000 kilometers or through the to the park bray near to the rameshwaram right why is it spotted it is spotted because please comment in the comment section if you are aware of it see it is spotted because there is a change in the pressure the change in the pressure had led to the transfer of this bird from that region to this region right now looking into the next article see our next article deals with the forest rights act this has been discussed in detail in our daily current affairs classes also see i'll not be going in detail into the forest rights act because 
many times I have discussed this in the previous classes as well. Now there is an associated topic with respect to the Forest Rights Act and its implementation and association with the particularly vulnerable tribal groups. Right? We will now be looking into the Act and its association with the PVTG. Right? See firstly we have to look into the particularly vulnerable tribal groups. In India there are tribes and within these tribes there is segregation as well. The tribes that are living in Andaman are different from the tribes that are living in the Uttarakhand. Their lifestyles are different, their conditions are different, even their food habits, their culture, everything is different. So we cannot take, we cannot give the same rights to all the tribes and we cannot also consider these two tribes are equal. For which the government of India has categorized the tribes into various categories for their welfare or socio-economic development. Right? Now this kind of one of the classification that has been taken is called PVTG, right. Now what is PVTG? Within the tribes, those tribes which are very much vulnerable, they are called particularly vulnerable tribal groups, right. That means there is a definition to the particularly vulnerable tribal groups. Before that, let us quickly solve a question based on this article. I will again after discussing this article, I will ask, I will solve this question. But before, once give a reading to this question and try to answer by it yourself. See, I will read the question out for you. Consider the following statements with respect to the particularly vulnerable tribal groups. Statement 1 says that the PVTGs are the marginalized sections of the scheduled tribes of India. Statement 2 says that the PVTGs are sections who are relatively isolated educationally and socially economically backward classes living in a habitat far away from the amenities. Statement 3, PVTG is not a constitutional category nor are these constitutionally recognized community. Statement 4 says that government of India classification created with the purpose of enabling improvement in the condition of certain communities with particularly low development. It is says that government of India has created this classification and it is not part of the constitution. So, please post your answers in the comment section and let me see what do you comment. Okay. Let me wait for 30 odd seconds so that I could see the comments. Let me read it for you, four options. The PVTGs are marginal sections of the scheduled tribes of India. The PVTGs are sections who are relatively isolated, educationally and socially backward communities living in habitat far away from the amenities. Statement 3, PVTGs are not constitutionally categorized. These are constituted by the central government. Statement 4, the government of India has classific classification created this PVTG. Purpose of enabling improvement in the conditions of certain communities with particularly low development. See, here the answer is A is correct, B is correct. All the statements are correct. Firstly, PVTGs are not constitutionally categorized. They are not constitutional category, right? It is a category which has been given by the government of India, right? For our convenience, the government has created this particular group for its convenience. It has characterized those tribes, is tribes may, whoever has the lowest standard of living with respect to socio-economic conditions. They have different culture, different language, they are isolated. These conditions have been taken into account, right? So, let us quickly discuss this article. Before that, I wanted to ask you, how do you define a tribal community in India? How do you define a tribal community in India? See, the definition of tribes has been clearly defined in the constitution of India with respect to article 366 and 342. Article 342 says that the president of India will de designate a particular community as a tribal community after taking consultations with the governor of that state, right. But on what basis the governor will give recommendations that so please designate these people as a tribal community. For that there has been a committee that has been set up and that committee's name is Lokur committee. Now this Lokur committee has given certain standards. These standards are firstly the community should have primitive traits, right? They should have primitive traits. And the second characterization, it should have a distinct culture. Their culture should be old, their culture should be of a distinctive in nature and they should have a primitive origins as well. Now, the third category is that they should be isolated or they should feel shy to get in contact with the general public, right? Feeling shy means they should not feel shy. It's generally the community characteristics, right? And fourthly, they should be geographically isolated as well. And fifthly, 
they should have a socio-economic backwardness as well. Now, if these five categories have been satisfied, local communities, community said, local community said that, please designate them as tribes, right? Now, once these tribes have been designated, after that, and another committee that has been set up in the year 1960 and 61, it is said that those rights that are given to the tribal rights, they are not aware, and especially within these tribal communities, those people who are living in the uh, extremely isolated areas like Jarawas, Onges, Sentinelis, you might have uh, heard across these tribes who are living in Andamars, Andaman Nicobars, and Kons, Beels, these are the tribes who also live in the peninsular part of India. So, these tribal communities, they are not much aware of the constitutional rights. They do not even know that they have these rights, right? And in spite of that, their living conditions are so harsh. They have their own traditional knowledge. They live with the traditional knowledge. Now, what if you go into any medical shop today, the kind of traditional medicines, if you see, they have their origins in the tribal community as well. Those medicines which have been used, it is the same medicines which have their chemical formula, chemical compositions. Now, they are packed and giving it to the form of a tablet which is sold, sold in the general medicine stores, right? So, those communities which are very much isolated, geographically isolated, these communities within that social categorization, Karkar, now they have asked, let us designate these tribes as primitive tribal groups in the year 1975, right? 1975 mein unko primitive tribal groups kaha gaya tha. After that, little later in the year 2006, in the year 2006, these primitive tribal groups, they have been renamed as PVTG. What is this? Particularly vulnerable tribal groups. Now, why they have taken the term primitive out of it? See, the term primitive is a negative orientation word. Now, what is primitive? Do you call tribals as primitive? No, they are actually living with the natures. They have a knowledge which is very much advanced at times. Their living conditions are harsh because they still live with the old traditions, right? So, that is why we should not be calling them as primitive people. We should be calling them as particularly vulnerable. They have changed the definition that too in the year post-2006. Now, why they have changed this definition or given another name? Because in the year 2006, there is an act that came up in the name of Forest Rights Act in the year 2006. Now, this Forest Right Act has come up and said that it is going to give certain rights to the tribal communities in two different forms. Now, the first form of this right is that it said that it will be giving livelihood rights. And it also said that it is going to give rights which are associated with land rights. It said that it will be giving land rights and it also said that it is going to give livelihood rights. Now, land rights means every tribal community, a family will have, will be given maximum of four acres of land for each family, right? Now, they can use that land for their for their welfare for purposes. Similarly, it also said that they are going to give certain community land. In this community land, they can do forestry activities. And it also said that it is going to give livelihood rights. That means this community uh, land that it can be used and grown some trees or fruits or any activity which can give some revenue to it. Now, this community will handle this land, right? Like that, there are certain rights that have been given in the 2006. But nowhere they have mentioned who is a PVTG. Now, for the definition of a PVTG, what they have gone for is they try to define this PVTG groups on the basis of a four different distinctive characteristics. Now, what are, what are these four distinctive characters which will tell this person is also a tribe along with this tribe. Now, we can call this tribe as particularly vulnerable tribal groups. Now, the first condition they have said is that the technology which they are using for their cultivation or their living standards should be of a pre-agricultural level. level pe hona chahiye, right? Pre-agricultural level, how do we use to do agriculture? Those kind of conditions, those kind of living conditions if this tribal community is having. Now, let us call them as PVTG. Along with that, their population over a period of time should come down, right? Instead of increasing, their population should have decreased. And this community should have extremely low level of literacy, right? Extremely low level of literacy and along with that, they should have a substance, subsistence level of economy. Now, what do you mean by subsistence level of economy? Whatever the agriculture or the work they do, that amount of food they get, it is only for their survival, but they won't be using this amount or a food product for getting out some revenue, 
now this is called as subsistence level of the economy right so this is the definition of a pvtg and today pvtgs are not defined in the constitution pvtgs are actually defined by the government for its general classification and the welfare and the development of these people right so it has no constitutional linkage right and pvtgs are marginalized sections of the scheduled tribes of india yes the statement is right and the second statement that i have given is they are relatively isolated educationally socially and politically backward right that is also true it is a government of india classification so once let's go back to the question and look into the answer here let's look into the statement one pvtgs are marginalized sections of the tri scheduled tribes yes the statement is right now statement two pvtgs are sections who are relatively isolated educationally and socially economically backward this statement is also right now the statement three pvtg is not a constitutional category yes it is not a constitutional category it a government it is a government of india classification for the welfare of the tribal group right lastly government of india classified this yes it has classified here the answer is d the answer here is d all of the above are correct right so once quickly look into the categories also what are the criteria number one pre agricultural level this is very much important for the mcq type of questions so questions can directly come out from these kind of statements right one pre agricultural level of technology two they should have a stagnant or declining population three they should have extreme low level of literacy and fourth a subsistence level of economic activity should be there right now let's move to the next article see next article is that a two days back on july 28th earth overshoot day is celebrated it is earth overshoot day is being identified it is not celebrated because we don't celebrate the overshoot days firstly let us try to understand what exactly is an earth overshoot day see every year your earth every year your earth has a capacity to regenerate regenerate the renewable sources of energy every year your earth can regenerate some amount of energy right now if how much time we are taking this energy to be burned in the earth now this is called earth overshoot day see for example the earth is giving out 100 units of energy to us now instead we using this 100 units in the 365 days we are simply using this 100 units by the end of july 28 itself right by july 28 itself we are completely using the total energy that is re regenerated by the earth so this becomes very much risky for us for the future generations in terms of sustainable development so let us quickly once look into the definition aspect here earth overshoot day marks a date when humanity has used all the biological resources the earth regenerated during this entire year that means all the biological resources that the earth has regenerated we have used them completely by the end of july 28 itself now july 28 is considered to be the earth overshoot day now what are the changes that have be, we have seen since the last couple of decades you have to look forward into this firstly if you look in the year 1971 our earth overshoot day was december 1st okay this is how our earth used to be on the december 1st that means whatever the earth used to regenerate we are using those regenerated ener energy or the resources by the december 1st slowly by the 71 a lakar up tak by the time we have almost come till july 28 right that means whatever the earth is generating we are using it by july 28 itself so in this conditions how many earths do we need it is said that we need almost two earths right we almost need two earths if you are going to use the same kind of energy same amount of energy right so earth is no longer in a position to bear the amount of population the amount of resources we are using so in this condition when the earth cannot bear this what does the earth do it changes its climate right earth changes its climate now climate change is inevitable you can see that earth overshoot day all the way from december 1st se lekar it has dropped to july slowly slowly it is no wonder this can even come to the january february march also right now there is a report that has come up it says that if us 
if the world's population is living like this the us would be needing almost five planets like earth if all the population of us is the entire global population right now look at india we do not need the entire world our standard of living is extraordinary in terms of overshoot capacity we are actually using the resources in a deficit manner right it is generally supposed to use those resources if the by the end of 365 days but we are not even we are taking more number of days to use those energy that means we are on a positive note but look at the countries like usa russia germany uk china and brazil now what are these countries these are the largest economies of the world and india being the fifth or sixth largest economy of the world we are still not using the same amount of energy that means we should be rewarded in terms of climate change right we are the flag bearers of the climate change we are the sustainable development right okay now next article that we deal, we are going to deal with is it is today's newspaper news paper published article which talks about manas newspaper sorry manas national park has 24 tigers for every ti manas has 2.4 tigers for every tiger right sorry for the mispronunciation so manas national park is now having 2.4 females for every one male so this is something to be seen as a positive entity right so our interest here is not how many number of tigers are present here our interest should be to look forward the climatic conditions of the manas and what they have done to increase the population of the tiger to 2.4 right what did manas do manas national park authorities have done to increase this population ratio to 1 is to 2.4 for every one male there is 2.4 female now this is an indication that the tiger population in the near future can increase in the manas tiger reserve why because tigers generally do interbreed they do interbreeding right within the same family they breed so because of which the tiger population can increase more because more number of females are there right so for the examination point of view what we have to look forward is the location see if you look into the location of the manas national park or manas tiger reserve it is on the in the assam where the manas river is passing through now this national park has border with bhutan theek hai bhutan mein bhi ye national park hai right now what is the name of national park in the bhutan it is called royal manas national park ठीक है, इट इज कॉल्ड रॉयल मानस नेशनल पार्क इन भूटान इन इंडिया वी कॉल इट एज मानस नेशनल पार्क नो वॉट इज द सिग्निफिकेंस ऑफ दिस नेशनल पार्क सी फर्स्टली इफ यू सी मानस इज अ लैंड फॉर मेनी क्रिटिकली एंडेंजर्ड स्पीशीज इफ यू नो द स्मॉलेस्ट पिग इन इंडिया इन द नेम ऑफ पिग्मी हॉग दैट पिग्मी हॉग इज ऑल्सो लोकेटेड इन दिस ग्रास लैंड सो मानस इफ यू लुक इन टू द वेजिटेशन सी इफ दिस इज योर मानस नेशनल पार्क दिस मानस नेशनल पार्क हैज an area of grasslands okay these are grasslands and here you have hills these hills are himalayas foothills himalayan foothills now just across the himalayan foothills you have grasslands in this grasslands you find two species the first species is the critically endangered species which is called as pygmy hawk ठीक है ओके लेट मी राइट इट हियर सो दैट इट विल बी इजी फॉर यू राइट इमेजिन दिस इज योर मानस नेशनल पार्क एंड दिस इज योर असैम राइट हियर यू हैव सटैन हिल्स दैट आर बॉर्डरिंग बाउंड्री बिटवीन इंडिया एंड भूटान सो दिस एंटायर एरिया बिफोर इंडिपेंडेंस बिफोर इंडिपेंडेंस इट वॉज इन british india right so you have to know some history behind this right before that see this is your royal manas national park this is our manas national park right earlier this is called coach bihar wildlife sanctuary or coach bihar hunting reserve so the raja of bhutan who used to have a family and that family used to hunt this for the hunting purpose they used to use this 
But later over a period of time what happened the conservation has been increased in the year 1972 we have signed the agreement for preserving the tigers in the name of project tiger we started and that's when post independence the protection status of this manas tiger reserve has increased right before independence it was under the control of the royal family here you will see an area of grassland these are the area of grasslands grasslands means chote chote aapko grass dekhne ke liye milega now next to the grasslands you will also find some number of trees theek hai you will, you can also see the trees as well now this is moist deciduous forest now you can also see another forest that is semi evergreen forest semi evergreen forest semi evergreen forest bhi aapko dekhne ke liye milega now this has varied vegetations you also find alluvial soils you also find the very fertile soils where the river manas will be flowing through this national park right there is a manas wildlife sanctuary there is a manas national park manas also world heritage site this is also a world heritage site as well right world heritage site bhi hai so that's why it becomes very much important for the examination here see the grasslands have different species the tree area deciduous forest have different species the semi evergreen forest they have different species now if you look into the number of species here it holds two critically endangered species which are also called as which are also called as indicator species which are present in the grasslands number 1 it is pygmy hog theek hai number 2 it is bengal floricon it is also bengal floricon now these two species are called as indicator species can you comment down what is indicator species what are indicator species see indicator species are those species if the grasslands are good these species will stay here if the grasslands are bad they will go away from this region so in the recent times what happened is that they have improved the grasslands because of which the indicator species started to coming back now when these species are found in this region it is an indication that this grassland is in a good condition so there are two critically endangered species that means their population is now less than 50 individuals now less than 50 individuals so pygmy hog status abhi recently change ho gaya from critically endangered its status have been now changed but bengal floricon inka population kafi kam hai right now leave this next to this you also find tigers you also find rhinoceros you also find elephants you also find leopards right now it becomes a very great combination you also find tigers you find the leopards you find rhinoceros you find elephants right now when these kind of all cat family if they are found they are said to be big five all the big five cats the big five animals they are found here right see in the bhutan it is bhutan national park and this national park is having an international boundary so international boundaries are very very important can you also comment on what are the other national parks which they also have the international boundary please comment down in the comment section if you are aware of it so also let us quickly see the other national parks which are present in the assam manas national park which is present in the region that is extending to the bhutan in this and other national parks include raimona national park which has been recently in the year 2022 itself this area is designated as national park right now seventh national park after the raimonia it is your dihang patkai national park which has been notified in the year 2022 only so these two national parks are also very important right for the exam now apart from this there is orang nameri kaziranga dibru saikova it total accounts to seven national parks in the state of assam itself seven national parks in the state of assam itself right and nextly if you see there are national parks which they do also have international boundaries that is barandri here you find a small national park this is barnadi wildlife sanctuary it also has international boundary manas also has international boundary right once quickly look into the species 
that are present in the Manas Wildlife Sanctuary. See here, the species which I mark, it is tigers, leopards, Indian rhinoceros and clouded leopard. This is also an important species that is also found in the Manas National Park, both leopard and clouded leopard. Apart from this, you also find the elephants and Indian rhinoceros, right? Elephants and, and Indian, yes, right? Please comment in the comment sections, right? Please comment in the comment sections. There is also critically endangered species. This critically endangered species are present here, right? Please comment in the comment section. I have just told what are the critically endangered species, right? Okay, right. See, this is, this is the next article. This article talks about there is a boundary that has been changed between two nations, right? There is a boundary that has been changed between two nations. One is your Switzerland, one is your Italy. So, why is this boundary changed? This boundary has changed because of the glaciers melting. Now, how are these boundaries that are helping to, that are degrading the boundary line between two nations? Now, this is an article which is associated with your climate change. In the examinations, in the descriptive examinations, you can give examples how climate change is affecting the international boundary lines. So, in the international boundary lines, if you look forward with respect to the climate change, here a climate can create a war, a climate can create refugees, right? So, when the climate change is happening here, the glaciers are melting and the boundary line is being receded into the Switzerland side. That means, the area of the Italy is increasing into the, into the Italy side. Because of which, because of which what happens is that here, you have to understand it can create a war like situations in the future right right now five next article is regarding next article is regarding the national herald this is in news since some time so this is an issue let us quickly this this is in news for quite some time Firstly, we will discuss what exactly is this article, right? And for the examination point of view, what we have to look forward into these articles, right? Firstly, let us go back to the history of National Herald. See, the National Herald is a newspaper. This is a newspaper which is associated with the brainchild of Nehru, right? Back in 1930s, the brainchild of Nehru has given the National Herald. So, they have, cons they have inception that this paper should be of national level and we can criticize the British government at that point of time, right? So, it is not owned by Nehru, but around 5,000 odd, 5,000 odd freedom fighters, they have been associated with this national newspaper and they started to criticize the government then, right? It was before independence. And slowly, all these 5,000, they used to write articles. Now, who publishes this national, this newspaper? This newspaper is published by the Associate General Limited, right? National Herald is published by Associate General, right? See, I won't be dealing into the political activities of this kind, this uh, issue. I will only be giving the constitutional activities and what are the constitutional methodologies that are in, involved in here, right? Only for the examination point of view, we will be discussing. So, this National Herald is a publishing group which gives Hindi, English and Urdu. So, this English newspaper is nothing but your National Herald. So, once the independence came in the year 1947, Nehru, who was the chairman, has now resigned from this National Herald and it is said that because he himself has formed the government, so this National Herald will not be in a position to criticize the government if the Nehru is the chairperson. So Nehru, Pandit Nehru has moved out from the chairmanship and now the conflict of interest has been moved out. Slowly, this newspaper has been the voice of the Congress even after the independence. So this newspaper has now even functioned till the year 2008, right? Since 2008, this newspaper has been functioning right? When it is functioning post 1990, 
when the LPG reforms came, there are more newspapers that have established. Slowly, this newspaper went into losses. Now, it had a losses of 90 odd crores. When this had 90 odd crores, it is actually the All India Congress Committee is now started to give funds to the National Herald newspaper so that they can pay the salaries. But after a period of time, it was no longer in a functional mode. So, then came into picture that is Young India Foundation. Young India Foundation. This Young India Foundation, which is owned by 36% is owned by the political functionaries of Rahul Gandhi and Sonia Gandhi. They took a loan of around X amount from a different company and they started, they have acquired the National Herald. Right. Now, in this due process, it is said that, it is said that they have also taken, they have also taken the 90 crore liability of this. Liability means, you know, loan jo pay karna tha, they were learning in losses, right? 90 crore, they have also taken the losses. Young India have also taken the losses. And in the due process, it is also said that they have also acquired the buildings, the functions and the functionaries of this newspaper, which is of thousands of crores. Now, here comes the issue of money laundering, right? For our examination point of view, we have to look forward for money laundering. What is money laundering? See, in simple terms, if I have to define the term money laundering, it can be like this. In the childhood, see, during our childhoods, you might have known that we used to play a small game that you put a ball and you put a glass under this ball. You put a glass above this ball like that. Now, this is an empty glass. This is an empty glass. What we do? We juggle from one each other and we'll ask to find out our kid or some one of your friend that where is the ball present, right? Now, this is a person. He is confused. He don't know, no? He don't know when you're juggling where you have put that ball. So, this fellow might have, might can point here, can point here, can point here, right? So, in this due juggling process, it, it is very difficult for this kid to identify where the ball is, right? Now, imagine the same is done by the government of India, okay? The same is done by the government of India, right? If the same is done by the government of India with respect to, with respect to, imagine this ball is money. Okay. You don't know if at all an ex person, the elder person who is juggling this ball, if at all this ball is a money that has come from illegal sources and you are juggling this to avoid the government find out this kind of money. So, this becomes a money laundering and all this money have come from illegal sources, right? When this money has come from illegal sources, this becomes money laundering, right? See, a money laundering usually has three principles. One, it should have a placement component, it should have a layering component, it should have an integration component, right? Firstly, now, what is this? These are what are these three processes? First one, see, you have collected some illegal money, right? Which are not taxed. You don't know where is the source coming from. Now you started to place this money into the banking system, right? You started to place this money in the banking system through juggling process. Okay. You what did you do? You have taken this money and you have now started to put this money in the banks. Once you have put this in the banks, this is already a dirty money. This is a dirty money. That means it is not taxed. It is not accounted by government. You have used some funds. You have used some functionaries to avoid this kind of activity. So slowly, the money you have put in the banks and from that money, you are being layering that. Layering means from one bank to another bank. You purchase something, you sell something. You purchase another thing, you sell some another thing. So slowly, you construct a building, you demo, you change that building and you you sell this building to someone else. Now, the, it, it is very difficult for the government to identify where is the source, right? And slowly, what you do? By using this money, by changing layering and all, you will start to integrate it to buy or establish a aeroplane company. You can establish another company a motor vehicle company or a watch company or else you can establish another newspaper as well, right? What you have done here, firstly, you have taken an illegal money from there, you are placing into the 
institutional systems and from the institutional systems you are layering over transferring buying selling giving it to another person slowly you have layered it now the government usually looks into the top layer but the actual source is somewhere else and this is an illegal source right now he this becomes the money laundering now using this money what you do you go and buy a big companies so in order to deal with this kind of situations in india we have a body called that is enforcement directorate so enforcement directorate ke bare mein hame padhna padega right now enforcement directorate it looks after three acts one is the foreign exchange regulation act that is along with that it is also taking care of the prevention of money laundering act right enforcement direct implements prevention of money laundering act and also it implements the foreign exchange regulation act right fema and pmla today the inquiries that are going on under the money laundering act prevention of money laundering see money laundering already ho chuka hoga lekin what is this act telling prevention of money laundering act right prevention means if at all there is a possibility that they can there is a possibility that this person can do money laundering even then enforcement directorate can come into picture and inquire them right so for getting how does ed government the functioning of the ed takes place ed's functioning will take place in such a way they employ people from income tax they employ people from uh, police services other professionals advocates and all they this organization becomes a team now they do not have direct recruitment your income tax post when you clear the services you can also be posted into the enforcement directorate they will take care of the pmla and fema act now in this pmla what there should be a prerequisite firstly someone should come and put a case in the police station and from the police station the enforcement directorate if at all the police station feels that okay there can be a chance of money laundering then they will send the case to the enforcement directorate right so here who might have complaint against the national leaders who are presently being enquired by the enforcement directorate okay that is locus standi okay that is locus standi locus standi matlab agar it means the person who has the right to knock at the door of the court a place of standing the right to be heard in court or other proceedings that means if at all i have to be a locus standi of the national herald case where subramanya swami has went into the court and said that there is a money laundering going on can the subramanya swami has the power and authority to go into the private affairs when they one can buy and sell their own private affairs the answer here is it is the supreme court said that as this is a public issue locus standi that means this person has the rights to go and complain or can seek the permission to enquire now this is a place of standing the right to be heard in the court or the proceedings right in simple terms you can be present in the court right that is called locus standi thank you guys and this is it for today we'll be coming up more relevant articles in the next week thank you and take care